Good evening. Um, this is yet another episode of The Facts, and my name is Lenore von Stein, and I'm, this episode we're, we're going to be talking about torture. It's a continuation of a, another discussion we had, and I'm sitting here tonight with three people, um, uh, as you can see, uh, Christine Husky, who is the director of the Anti-Torture Program at Physicians for Human Rights, uh, James Cullen, who is a retired brigadier general uh, who served in um, the justice system and the judge, uh, judge advocates general's office, now a lawyer in Manhattan, and Taylor Prendergast, who is a, a senior attorney at the New York Civil Liberties Union. And um, it, we were talking before, something came up, this idea of the rule of law, of the importance of law, the idea of law in the, in the, in the evolution of human, um, human societies uh, that, you know, as, as opposed to you know, the king can make a decision to chop off your head, there are rules, and that the ru and, and that these rules, you know, at least in theory, on paper, apply to everybody. <laughs> you know, it's a law, uh, and and it's, uh, and it seems like torture is one of the, you know, of course it's legal torture, so it could be legal, it could be a law, but uh, it seems like an ultimate. Co uh, um, Well, it's 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 very uh, terrorizing. Well, I guess I would sort of follow on that and say, I mean, under just talking about you know torture could be legal, um, and I want to say it is not. Uh, it is not legal under international law, and it is not legal under U.S. domestic law. And I think that when exceptions start to be made. Um, and people see it as sort of a necessity. That's when the you know the system really starts to break down, and you have um, sort of sy systematic torture and abuse of vulnerable populations like detainees at Guantanamo uh, or or Parwan. Um, and we were talking earlier, sort of you know right after 9/11, there was a um, sort of a, a you know the administration said that the laws don't apply at Guantanamo. They don't apply to these to these people. Now I think, I think since then the rule of law has been coming back, um, but the fact is is that as a society we are still sort of debating torture, and I think that's because we still see that there, you know, I think falsely so that there is some sort of necessity for this exception that you know, and um, and Jim, you had mentioned you know that it that you know as far as the military is concerned. Um, it, it's it's you know simply not good. No, it. Um, <clears throat> we teach young soldiers from the time they come into the service in basic training uh, that the <clears throat> law of war and the uniform code of military justice absolutely forbids torture, and they have a responsibility not only not to engage in it, but to report it if they see it. And it, we must keep in mind that it was a young soldier who reported what had happened at Abu Ghraib. Mm -hmm. Just like back during Vietnam, it was a young soldier who persistently uh, kept after the authorities to talk about Mi Lai. So it, it was great young people. There were experienced people in the Naval Criminal Investigative Service who insisted on reporting up the chain of command what was happening at Guantanamo even as the Cheney and Bush underlings were implementing policies of torture that they had inserted in a most twisted way. Violations of the law of war present major discipline problems for the military. First of all, if we engage in this kind of conduct, we are in essence saying to our enemies in future wars, because this will not be our last war. Human nature yeah. is such that we are only looking at the present conflict. You can pick your poison down the road. Is it North Korea? Is it somebody else? We will be engaged in a war. And whether or not the opponent, the enemy in that war, observes the law of war or not, we can hold them accountable once we capture them. But by engaging in torture ourselves, we've given them a green card to say and to invoke as a defense, we did nothing more 
than what the American administration adopted in the torture policies in 2002. Mm -hmm. This terrifies us because the one thing we want to assure our young soldiers is if they are captured, we will insist on the application of the law of war to protect them. Cheney, and <clears throat> being a draft dodger himself, didn't quite get that. And he was looking just for immediate returns, and he thought fear was the answer. Cast aside the rule of law. Go for the point of convenience, almost like some of our corporate executives did in looking for short-term uh, quarterly returns and to heck with what happens to the long-term health of the company. Right. It was that same kind of mentality. But when a soldier <clears throat> engages in this kind of conduct, there are really two victims in that room where the torture occurs. There's the obvious victim who is being tortured and who now is no longer an effective source of intelligence. But the person engaging in the torture is going to be damaged as well. We as an institution in the military would fail the American people if we ever countenanced or even worse, train people to engage in that. When we take young American men and women and bring them into the military, we promise in effect to their parents and their spouses, we, we cannot promise that we will necessarily be able to return them in good health because we know the risks of the battlefield. But if they do come home, there is an implicit promise they will come back as better citizens because they will be taught that personal sacrifice and, and your very life is at stake and is going to be surrendered possibly for the welfare of your people, of your country, of your fellow service people. When we send that young person home, he's your teacher, she's your uh, police officer, maybe a judge, the person living next door to you. If we train that person to be a torturer, we have violated that implicit promise we make to the American people that person is going to be damaged. And if the command doesn't take action to stop that, to make sure it doesn't happen, we have failed as an institution. Now our commanders get it, they understand, because not only do we train the young soldier who was brought into the military initially, but we also take the senior officers and we bring them down and if they're appointed to flag rank, that is to a general or to an admiral, they're brought to the Judge Advocate General School for an intensive one-on-one -on -one course, a large part of which has to do with the doctrine of command responsibility mm -hmm. and the law of war. What are their responsibilities? Because we tried Germans and Japanese at the end of World War II for their failure to properly follow the rule of law and to properly take care of prisoners of war. We went after the Japanese mm -hmm. who waterboarded our soldiers. One of Colonel Jimmy Doolittle's pilots was waterboarded. And we tracked down the people who did that and we prosecuted them quite properly. So we have long precedents. We court-martialed a general, Jacob Smith, during the Philippine insurrection because, among other things, he authorized war, uh, uh, waterboarding. Teddy Roosevelt personally endorsed his court-martial. We have a long tradition of following the rule of war because we recognize that if you don't, and you don't insist upon discipline among your troops, you're not going to have any more an effective fighting force. You will be an ill-disciplined mob. So well, why, why do you think, I'm sorry, I was just no, sort yeah. of following <clears throat> up on the, why do you think that we're now debating or that you have presidential candidates um, suggesting, one, that waterboarding is not torture, um, or that if it is, it would be okay in certain situations. And why are we even debating waterboarding? I, w one thing that strikes me when we talk about torture, uh, um, I, don't, I don't know about you, I come from a poor neighborhood, and I, I, it's, not, it's not just talking about torture in this military context. Uh, what about the police station context? What about, what about, what about, you know, you mentioned something about vulnerable people who you know are utilized who are who are you know mistreated in prison so populations prison populations i mean that there's a there's this this line that just sort of like like a like the mighty amazon or something that fed out in, into this and and when you don't pay attention to this all this other stuff all this <coughs> other torture that exists in the society uh this um 
I mean, you know, sometimes when you look at old movies like from the 30s and the cops are beating up, up people like nobody's business, you know, and it's it's okay, and mm -hmm. you don't see that quite so much in New Mall. Maybe you do if you watch 24 or something. <laughs> um, but it's 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 gotten. It, I, I mean, I guess I'm curious why it, why it goes out of vogue. Um, well, somewhat. I, I think in some ways, you know, it, it's both the tragedy and opportunity of what happened at Guantanamo to inform the public discussion about what has been happening domestically for a very long time. You know, Christine in the last episode was reeling off some of the different types of conditions that prisoners at Guantanamo were subject to, extreme isolation, periods of complete idleness. Those are conditions for those of us who have been doing prison advocacy work for a very long time are all too familiar with regards to tens of thousands of Americans that we incarcerate in solitary confinement mm -hmm. every year. Um, so I think that there are a lot of parallels between the ways that we were treating people at Guantanamo and the ways that we're treating people here domestically. And if there's a silver lining to the public consciousness that was raised by the revelations at Guantanamo, it's perhaps that we can start to think even more critically about whether our, huma our practices here domestically are humane. Returning to another, another issue that we were talking about specifically in the prior episode, the legislation in New York and other states to really hone in on the practice of medical and, med and mental health professionals. Just as there were medical and mental health professionals who were key to the implementation of the torture regime at Guantanamo, the same thing is happening in our prisons and jails. There are psychologists and uh, mental health professionals and therapists who are uh, absolutely necessary for the perpetuation of the solitary confinement regime in the United States. And so I think many of the same questions need to be raised and addressed both here and, uh, and abroad. Taylor's right. I mean, there's a, a big movement now where people are really looking at the use, I should say, overuse and abuse of solitary confinement. Obviously, in some situations, it may be appropriate. Um, and in fact, um, there will be a, a hearing in the uh, Senate uh, next week mm -hmm. on the use of solitary confinement. It's the first one ever. Um, and yeah, I hate to agree that there may be a silver lining here, but it really is looking at uh, I, I'd say sort of the use of, um, you know, sort of getting away from the, you know, the pulling of the fingernails and looking at sort of conditions as uh, forms of possible torture or cruel and human and degrading treatment, such as solitary confinement. And we talked earlier about um, the use of indefinite detention, which is um, also a, a condition which can lead to psychological and physical trauma and in some cases could be torture or, or cruel and human and degrading treatment, you know, combined with other uses of like solitary confinement when you're detained indefinitely. Um, there are, are severe physical and psychological harms um, that are come as a consequence. When I when I when I just uh, when I put myself when I try to walk in the moccasins of somebody who's who's uh, detained um, indefinitely or detained, you know, that you have these people who are who are looking after you, who are controlling you, who wish you no well, and they make it very how scary, how where where do you go in your head to get through days after days after day after day of that? How do you how do you adjust yourself? I mean, and then you know, no sleep, which make you crazy right away. Well, I think in some ways that's where um, the doctors and psychologists come in, and especially, you know, as Taylor was mentioned, uh, was mentioning. I mean, they, you know, they are a part of the the prison system, and um, my organization has actually done a couple of reports on this issue of dual loyalty, uh, where when, when you're a doctor in a in a um, prison system and you are seeing patients who are prisoners, I mean, you have an absolute obligation to them, but it can be very confusing because they're working for, the doctors working for the state, which has a completely different interest over that prisoner. It is not a, um, it, it's, it's somewhat of a, of a conflict for the doctor or psychologist. And I think uh, in some ways at Guantanamo and Abu Ghraib, it was very difficult for doctors and psychologists to, um, to sort of grapple with that even harder in, in prisons because of all the pressure from the top down um, basically saying well the rule of law doesn't apply here and everything so it was almost as if you know there was no constitutional law there was no international law um, so you had sort of the prison situation but 
but you know, sort of magnified. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's why the, the New York legislation is so important because it regulates doctors licensed by New York no matter where they are, whether they're in a prison in New York or you know, at really? Guantanamo. Mm -hmm. that, that is a huge aspect mm -hmm. of it and protects <coughs> whistleblowers and requires mm -hmm. um, reporting. Mm -hmm. And, re and return, returning to the broader theme that we were talking about earlier regarding the rule of law and why it's so important not only to the military and military effectiveness but also just to the fabric of our democracy is because it's in times of trauma and pressure when the rule of law is so important. Mm -hmm. Those are the instances when we should be strictly adhering to the rule of law, not making exceptions to it as the Bush administration did in the war on terror. As the Obama administration. As the Obama administration continues to do in That's some correct. respects. And to give it right. a quite concrete example, in the case that we were talking about in the last episode regarding the psychologist Dr. John Lesso, you know, Dr. Lesso has never talked about his role publicly in designing the Guantanamo torture regime, so we're not exactly sure what his feelings were. But one can look at the uh, records that have been made public and some of the other physicians who have written about that regime and conclude that Dr. Lesso was a very reluctant participant in the torture regime, that he knew that there was something amiss here, that he was under a tremendous amount of pressure to help in the design and implementation of this uh, torture regime, and he did so. And that's precisely the time when a professional is under so much pressure to conform that we need clear and unambiguous guidance, both with the rule of law, including criminal law and prohibitions against torture, but also against in terms of ethical codes mm -hmm. that make quite clear, even to someone who is not has no malicious intent, that they have to say no to the prison official or the CIA operative or the person running the Guantanamo cell, that they can't participate in this, they can't sanction it, and that they have a duty to report what they've seen and heard. Mm -hmm. Or they'll lose their license. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the, that's the great tie-in yeah. to, the, to the New York legislation. It's not just that it's prohibited, it's you will lose your New York license. And I think that's pretty. I think that's very key. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's great. I mean, I mean, it, it is it, great. Yeah, it should pass. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> is it? What are his chances? Well, I think it's uh, <clears throat> before the Rules and Codes Committee of the Assembly right now. Assemblyman Gottfried um, uh, introduced it, but he enjoys bipartisan support. Uh, Assemblyman Joel Miller, who is a Republican, is also a strong supporter of the bill, and I think anyone who can really looks at the merits of this bill it deserves to pass it needs to pass only because it's the not only because it's the right thing to do but it offers a shield mm -hmm. to any healthcare professional who in the future may be asked to participate wrongfully in this kind of a program he or she, she can say love to help you but i could lose my license mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's a wonderful shield and i think we deserve uh, to help our healthcare professionals who may be serving our country, may be brought in as contractors, and who don't want to violate their ethical obligations by in any way either designing, participating, mm -hmm. supervising any of these enhanced interrogation programs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think the urgency of the bill, uh, the bill is just as urgent f to be passed as ever, you know, for, for two reasons that we've talked about. Uh, although the events of September 11th and the torture that occurred shortly thereafter might be viewed by some people as being a historical event, uh, we certainly don't know what's going to happen the next time we're subjected to national trauma and how we might react. And for that reason alone, the bill should be passed, but also because the bill implicates the participation of healthcare professionals in our own domestic regime. And regardless of whether or not there is going to be a na another terrorist attack, there is every reason to both protect whistleblowers and impose these clear, unambiguous ethical duties on healthcare professionals that are working in our forensic hospitals, in mm -hmm. our jails, and in our prisons. The, the, you know, the idea that the Geneva Accords should just be thrown out the window because we're in war. I mean, I thought that's what they were about. They're, they happen when it's in war. If you're not at war, it's not a problem. You know, if everything's going well, you're not going to want to hurt some, Well, maybe you still want to hurt somebody, well, but, you know. But America was always at the forefront of getting that, uh, those treaties passed, both the original 1929 Geneva Convention and then the four Geneva Conventions in 1949. America laid its goodwill on, on, the, on the line to get other countries to realize with the lessons of World War II fresh in their mind why we needed 
this kind of a treaty. Now, it was interesting, when you look at the experience on the Western Front, where both sides more or less uh, adhere to the Geneva, the predecessor to the Geneva Conventions, uh, there were lapses. I mean, we tortured German submariners outside of Washington. The Germans executed American prisoners after Malmedy. But by and large, they adhered to the law of war. There was less than a 3% fatality rate among prisoners on both sides. When you looked at the experience on the Eastern Front, neither side, that is the Russians nor the Germans, adhered to the law of war for reasons chillingly similar to those advanced by Cheney and his underlings saying why we shouldn't follow the Geneva Conventions. One of the excuses that is amusing, if it wasn't so tragic, is that uh, Cheney said, well, and his lawyers, that Afghanistan was a failed state and therefore uh, the Geneva Convention wouldn't right. apply. Uh, usually in war, there is a loser, and they're called the failed state. Well, what happens until you get to the point, and what happens to your soldiers who are taken prisoner, until you get it to a point of either winning or losing? Should treaty obligations depend upon military success or loss? This is childish arguments, but it is among those that was adopted by the Nazis and by the communists. When you look at the experience of them on the Eastern Front, there was over a 70% fatality rate. So we have empirical evidence of why we be, should be following the Geneva Conventions and the law of war. You mentioned before, Lenore, why are we still having this national debate among uh, people who aspire to be uh, president as to uh, the use of enhanced interrogation. After Abu Ghraib, we put together a group of retired generals and admirals who were greatly concerned about what was emerging uh, from the torture memos. And one of the people who was at our side from the very beginning was Senator John McCain. His efforts at that time led to the passage of what we now refer to as the Detainee Treatment Act. And I remember his discussion at that time, he didn't think because of the opposition of Cheney and the White House to the bill he wanted to introduce saying that all agencies will adhere to the Army Manual on Interrogation, that there would be a chance of passing the bill that he had introduced. He said, but nevertheless, we should let history record that we made an effort, that there were people in America who were so offended by torture and the violation of the law of war that no one should ever ask in the future, where were the good Americans? As the question was asked, where were the good Germans? Where's McCain now on this? Oh, McCain is still solidly against torture and against mm -hmm. enhanced interrogation. Mm -hmm. Including, I mean, including waterboarding. Including when waterboarding. He's absolutely clear on that. And if you look at the people who were loudest in proclaiming this, none of them were veterans. None of them actually had the the military experience to tell them firsthand why this undermines national security for a whole lot of reasons we don't have the time to talk about and why it undermines our military. And our society. And the society. So we're, we're, we're at the four minute mark. Uh, so, so pulling this together, uh, I've, I've got these, these the, 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 the history of torture, a little effect, was, has, has torture been used by, well, it seems like it's obvious that it, you know, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's kind of a pithy question, used by default uh, because they weren't, be, we weren't going to use better interrogation, uh, yeah, obviously, you know, I just hit you on the head and hope that works. Um, uh, are, I had a question here, are there places or points in history where medical people were not involved in state-sponsored state uh, allowed torture, and you said, as far as you know, as there far aren't. As, I, as far as I know, which is not to say that um, I know the extent of all that history, but um, people smarter than myself, such as uh, Dr. Stephen Miles, who is a, a professor of, of medicine and bioethics and has done a lot of study on this, um, believes that doctors and, and mental health care professionals have, are, are almost always involved. Um, because of their unique role, um, which I would say going back to the New York legislation, which is why that's so important. They do, doctors have a unique role. So this, this, this do no harm thing that doctors have uh, patients first and just gets kind of patients but harm them. <laughs> uh, 
in the name of something else, in the name of, um, well, I mean, somebody I know said to me when I, when I, as this is what I said, oh, and done this, the, somebody I know said to me when he heard I was going to do the, you're going to do the other side, you know, and <laughs> there is no other There's side. There's no other side. There's no other side, you know. Uh, so, you know, rape works too, you know, should we do the other side? And um, no, there's no other side. This is a, this has got to stop. Um, it, that's a silly thing because it's going to take a very long time to stop it, right? It's going to take a very, it's, it's deeply entrenched in, in how people handle each other when they, they have their druthers uh, and they have their, you know, whatever's, you know, in prisons, in the army, in the, mm. you know, it's, it's... Well, see, I, I disagree. I don't yeah. know that it's deeply entrenched in... Usually I take the pessimistic view, but mm. I'm going to take the optimistic view. I don't know that it's deeply entrenched in, you know, in our history, um, because we have mm. always been sort of the champions of human rights and, um, and all of that. And, and in some ways I sort of put in some, aside the, the prison population, because I think that's kind of like an unspoken little hidden secret of ours. Um, so th sort of that notwithstanding. But, uh, you know, I don't think it's so entrenched. I think that we are going to come out of this, and I think one of the good things will be actually looking at some of the, the prison populations and how we treat our incarcerated prisoners. I certainly you know. hope so, because I think it's all a piece myself. But um, I, I, we, we, we're at the end. We're at the end. We should one end time. on having an optimistic, an optimistic view. Oh, I think. Totally yes. agree. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, and uh, so, listen, uh, Christine Husky, thank you very much. James thank you. Cullen, thank you very much. Taylor Prendergast, thank you very much. Uh, it's really been. Uh, this is uh, yet another episode. We, you know, now I, I never know how to do these things. I got thirty seconds. Uh, <laughs> and um, so, um, uh, I, I feel much better, and I, I'm. I'm not so afraid of this topic anymore, and that's what I'm doing here on the facts, you know, just taking these fears away from myself, and I hope perhaps we can do that for you guys out there too. You know.